Well, welcome back to another day of class. I've enjoyed the time getting to know you and sharing these truths from God's Word with you. We've already covered um, quite a bit of the first letter of Timothy, to Timothy, I should say. We dug a deep foundation. We dug down to find out the background and understand the culture and the churches. We understand a little bit about Paul and about Timothy. And we began to talk through the different pieces of Paul's first letter to Timothy. It's a very warm, it's a very personal letter. And it's about Paul addressing the presence of false teachers that have come into the city of Ephesus and that are causing disruptions to the churches and their teachings in that area. And so he has encouraged Timothy. He has pushed him a little bit to say, Timothy, let's go. You've got to stay in the fight. You must persevere. Don't give up. And he began, when we left off last Sunday, began talking through some of the priorities for worship in the church. He asked, and his top priority was that of prayer. And I think that's so important for us today, that prayer is the place where we begin, not the place that we add on to the end. And he especially came at men and he said, man, I want you of all people to be praying. I want you to have this open relationship with God and I want you to pray. And the last section we looked at yesterday was his address to women. And he said, within the context of worship in the church, women, this is what I ask of you. It's exciting for you. You're learning for the first time. You are participating with your husbands and your families in worship. Please restrain some of your excitement until you have a chance to be home with your husbands and learn in that context and serve in the way that God has asked you to serve and invited you to serve. One thing that I neglected to do was, as I did the first day, was to offer you a chance to do a bit of background study yourself. So if you choose to do some of the homework, this is the one that I would suggest to you after our study yesterday. What he was talking about in chapter two was essentially uh, finding a rhythm and a God-centered, gospel-oriented place of worship how we worship, what we do in worship, and some of the things that inform that. So my encouragement to you from the syllabus is that you write a short two-page study paper applying some of the principles that we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 2 in the context of worship in the churches in which you serve. You say, well, I'm not the pastor, I'm not a leader, but you can still look at your church and say, in our desire to worship God, these are the problems that we see. These are the opportunities that we have. As I look at what Paul said about prayer, as I look at what Paul said to the men, as I look at what Paul said to the women, this is the application I would like to make in our church setting. And so I would encourage you to do that. Just a short paper, look at the text, look at your situation and apply the two. What we're gonna do today is begin to get into the topic of leadership. What does leadership in the church look like? First, we go back and we base it on the foundation in the culture and the city of Ephesus. And then we'll go forward and look at what does that mean in our churches today? So I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. But let me give you an example first. I want us to be thinking about what kind of church leadership you would like. If you could design the perfect church leader, what would he look like? I came across this little um, writing or this little paragraph that I thought was kind of interesting. I'd like to share it with you. This is a wanted ad for a leader in a church. See if this resonates with you. He must have tact and a disposition that will enable him to side with all parties in the church on all points, but giving offense to none. He should possess a will of his own, but agree with all of the members. Are you seeing the impossibility? He must be socially inclined and of dignified manners, neither running after the wealthy nor turning his back on the poor. He must be willing to preach first-class sermons on second-class compensation. He should be able to convince all that they are miserable sinners without giving offense. Each sermon must be short, but complete in itself, full of old-fashioned theology in modern dress, deep but polished, free from theological terms and big words. He should be young enough to be enthusiastic, but he should, be, he should possess judgment of one who is ripe of years and depth of understanding and experience. Only he who possesses the above qualifications need apply. To such a one will be given steady employment for a term of three years. 
Now, I don't know how that sounds in your culture, but in my culture, I say, you know what? Sometimes I think that being a leader in a church is that impossible. That everybody in your church has expectations of what a leader should be like, of how he should act, of how he should teach, of how he should lead, things that he shouldn't do, things that he should do. Is that what the Bible says when it comes to talking about leadership? Well, apparently there must be a problem with the leadership in the churches of Ephesus, or Paul wouldn't have taken significant time here in chapter 3 to address it. We know that false teaching was coming in. We know that there were problems in the church with them staying pure and staying on track. But what about the issue of leadership? There were some in his church who apparently were not mature enough to be leaders yet. There were some in his church who didn't have the character that they needed. And that was affecting the quality and the health of their churches in a very uh, negative way. So when we come to this passage today, you're going to find something that I found intriguing, and it may to you as well. When you see the list of things that Paul asks a leader to be, they're character qualities and not a list of things to do or to not do. That what we're about to see is that a church is only as healthy as the character of its leaders. I want to say that again. A church is only as healthy as the character of its leaders. I could give you a list of a hundred things that I do and a number of things that I don't do, but if I don't possess a godly character, the church in which I serve is not going to be healthy. And you can think of it in this way. You can have a program for the children. You can have a program for the youth. You can have a program for the adults. You can have a program for the alcoholics. And all of those things are good things. But if the leaders do not have a godly character, you're not going to have a healthy church. And we see that time and time again. So, without any further explanation, let me just share with you verses 1 through 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. This is what Paul writes. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So what you've just seen is a long list of character qualities that make up a godly leader. I think that the thing that steps out to me, first of all, is his statement right at the beginning, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. See, I think, and I think maybe we take this too much for granted in our churches today, at least in the experience that I have, is that there should be something inside of a person that says, I, I want to serve in a significant way. I don't think that it comes with pride. In fact, it had better not come with pride or that's not the kind of leader you're looking for. But I think that there is an inner uh, compulsion or a prompting of the Holy Spirit that says, Bruce, I think that it's time for you to rise to leadership in this church. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, all of my life, God has put me in situations where I haven't had, I have had an opportunity to be in a leadership position. I can think back to my sixth grade in school. Uh, we had something called the Young Citizens League. It was, we did little projects and we painted various things and we tried to help our community and help our school. And in the sixth grade, there was something in me that said, I would like to be the president of that group. In our little sixth and seventh grade, we had this little election and they voted me to be the president of this little Young Citizens League. And uh, one of our projects was we painted the trash cans and put cute little signs on them outside our school. And I think of on through my high school years, I was a leader in our youth group. And then when I got into college, I was 
Uh, my senior year, I was the class president. There was something inside of me that, that God, it seemed like God was prompting me and saying, Bruce, this is what I've created you to do. When I became an adult, I became part of a church. I was a teacher and I served in other churches. And, and when I came to the church in which I now serve, there was this hunger in me to be involved in leadership, to be a part of the oversight of the church. Not everybody has that. But I think what Paul is saying, and I, I would say to any of you men who are hearing this, is God saying to you, you've been sitting on the sidelines too long. It's time for you to rise up and say, I think that I would like to serve in some kind of capacity in my church beyond the average ordinary ways to minister. And I'm not putting that down, by the way. But I would like to be in a place of oversight. I would like to be in a place of responsibility. And Paul says, if anyone aspires to, the idea is he sets his heart on it. He determines in his heart because there is a compulsion there that he, he wants to be a part of this significant thing. This idea of setting your heart on it reminds me of another example when Sasha was just four years old. We were at a concert. Our daughter Michaela plays the violin. And so we had gone to a concert and Sasha, she was just four, wasn't sitting still very well. So I, I took her out into the hallway of the school where the concert was. And as we walked into the hallway, this particular school had an elevator. And if you know what elevators are like, it had the buttons, the up button and the down button for the elevator on the wall. But she was so short at the time that she would reach up as high as she could reach. And she wanted to push that button, but she was about this far away from being able to touch it. So she would get up on her tiptoes and she would try and she would look at me as if, Daddy, can you help me push that button? When Paul says to set your heart on, that's the idea behind Sasha saying, I want to push that. There's something inside of me that I want to do that. I want to reach for that, that it is something that I haven't done yet, but I want to do it now. And so again, I say to you men, and it doesn't matter to me whether you're a teenage young boy or whether an older adult or whether a man in, the, in his prime of his life, is God saying to you, there is something for you that you need to reach for. It's going to stretch your faith. It's going to stretch your love for God and the practice of your faith. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, there are some parallel words in the New Testament, overseer or elder or bishop. They're similar words to each other. They're the men who would exercise oversight for the doctrinal purity of the church. That they are the persons who they aren't involved in everything, but they have oversight for it. Let me give you an example. I, I believe that I've told you previously that our church right now is constructing a new sanctuary. And I told you about the foundation and the footings and my friends have been sending pictures of the cement block walls beginning to go up. Well, it just so happens that the contractor overseeing the whole project attends our church. Now, I have seen him come to the project. I have seen him help out down in the footings. But honestly, his job is to oversee the whole project. If he tried to do all of the work, the work wouldn't get done and nobody would be in charge. So sometimes he's on the telephone calling this particular company. Sometimes he's on this telephone. He's calling this person you need to get over here right now, or he's ordering this particular product. And sometimes he's helping here, but he has the ability to oversee the project and get involved in the work at various points along the way. That's what an overseer in a church is like. They're not just a leader who says, well, I'm the leader. You follow me. I'll tell you what to do and you do all the work. No, this person is mature enough and he has enough experience to say, you know, I've been involved in ministry. I'm still involved in ministry, but God has called me to give some oversight to the direction of this church. It's not bureaucracy. It's simply a matter of serving in a way that says, I want to make sure that what is taught in this church is in accordance with God's word and his heart. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com